My first thought this morning was on my great riches. What substance, such treasures, the morning did bring. There was joy beyond telling, a hope beyond failing. I'm acquainted with all these things. I am familiar with mercy, known my share of victory. Covered with compassion every step along the way. The sweetest love there's been plenty. Forgiveness when need be. I am no stranger to grace. Pray this morning as I try to thank him his peace fell around me the same as yesterday and even though my tomorrows may have sadness and sorrow I will still be no stranger to grace I am familiar with mercy, known my share of victories. Covered with compassion every step along the way. The sweetest love, there's been plenty forgiveness when need be. The sweetest love, there's been plenty, forgiveness when need be. I am no stranger, I am no stranger, I'm familiar with mercy and Top notch, and uh, I was just talking with Karen uh, for the church service about some songs that her family sang when they came out to Green Bay, and I need to turn my microphone on. Yeah, and uh, push this until it turns green. Turn green. All right, that should yeah, that should do it. And uh, it, it just uh, it makes memories. It helps you. Um, Remember the good times, and uh, it's wonderful to uh, hear the men sing, and I certainly enjoyed Karen singing. I've always liked her singing. She's been a blessing to me over the course of the years. It's been wonderful. I want you to turn me to Romans chapter 8, if you would, um, this, uh, this evening. Well-known verse. Uh, everybody here has probably already memorized uh, this verse. Romans 8, uh, 28. It says there, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful to know we've got a God that uh, got the bases covered before we get there. We're thankful to know, Lord, that uh, nothing escapes your notice, and we know that anything that happens to us happens with your permission. Uh, Lord, we would ask that... Um, you might uh, acquaint us with uh, one of your ways tonight in case we're not familiar with this one. And Father, we ask that if we are familiar with it, we'd be strengthened in realizing that our God has good purposes in mind. He's got uh, our growth and our safety and our future benefit 
Our Lord, a lot of times outweighs our present circumstances, and we would ask that we would uh, have, as a result of tonight's message, a little better view of uh, one of the patterns in the Bible that you use over and over and over again. We ask your blessing on us as we speak and as we listen. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, I call this message the swamp. Uh, and every Baptist preacher I know of has got one like it. Your pastor has one. He calls it the wilderness. Uh, it's just, I, another guy calls it the, the uh, slow of despond. And uh, there's all kinds of different uh, names for the thing. Uh, basically what it is, it's a pattern in the Word of God that is repeated over and over and over and over again that you are not going to be exempt from. You're going to have to go through it. He chasteneth every son that he receiveth, and then he prunes every uh, tree that's bearing fruit, so that it might bear more fruit, and so forth, such that God's always interested in, uh, in our growth. Uh, this line here represents blessings, and this line here represents time. And uh, <clears throat> there's a certain thing that happens when uh, a Christian comes along and the, or a sinner comes along as being made a Christian. Uh, here he is down here uh, in the slow, uh, in this lost condition, and boom, he gets saved. And man, that's a great thing. Uh, can I tell you, that's, that's life changing. I'm not talking to folks that don't know that. But the surprise is that uh, he would like to have this thing uh, continue uh, as if it would just go like this and uh, you wind up up here as a spiritual saint and uh, you know maybe that takes 20 years maybe that takes 10 maybe it takes two but uh, sooner or later I'm going to be mature in Christ and uh, it's going to be a ladder of one step at a time uh, I've not found it so there's not a pattern like that in the Bible the pattern goes considerably different and it goes like this this thing crashes. Kaboom! And you wallow around down in here for an indeterminate amount of time. Uh, and then what happens? Well, then uh, we have the blessed hope for our, our personally and for the sinner in general, and zoom! Out he comes. And uh, he ends up on the line. He would have been if it had gone straight, but God has this down here to prove it. Uh, I call that down here the swamp. S-W-A-M-P. Now this up here, <clears throat> right here, is baby fat. You are just new at it, and... Uh, you are going to uh, have some encouragement. I can remember when I got saved, I got several prayers answered all at once. Uh, Lord, listen, I'd like to have you give me somebody to witness to at work. And boom, I'd go to work and some guy would ask me, Keck, what happened to you? Did you get religion? And uh, I would say, Lord, I would kind of like to uh, uh, get uh, Fridays off. And uh, Harvey Dunnell, my boss, would walk in and say, Keck, have you taken a Friday off recently? I said, no. He said, well, would you like to? I, prayers like that, that just out of the blue, that didn't seem to, but, but it's all baby fat. I had no idea what was going on. Uh, when the bottom drops out, you are, are down there now in the, in the swamp. And of course, this is the, boy, that doesn't look like it's uh, very readable. So let me put, go over this again. But the idea is that, uh, this here thing is what we all want. But, you know, it's easy to read. It's easy to understand. It's hard to believe sometimes. All things work together for good, really. Really. You've had at least two pastors that I was at a fellowship meeting with today that lost their wives. Uh, both of them have uh, fortunately remarried and uh, they seem to be happy and, 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 and so forth. Uh, eventually uh, this came along, but my goodness, man, that stuff down there hurts. And the difficulty 
uh, is consistent. That is to say, uh, if you can find that pattern in the Bible two or three times, then uh, we got something going here. Otherwise, it's just Pastor Keck blowing off steam. Let me see. Jesus Christ was born, right? Ministered for three and a half years, and then they killed him. Stayed down for three days, and the next time he isn't coming back to take sides, he's coming back to take over. Uh, all right, you got David. When Samuel went to anoint one of Saul's sons of Jesse, he had to ask Jesse, are these all thy sons? And Jesse said, no, I got a little kid out there that's watching the sheep. And bingo, he's anointed king. Uh, he faces Goliath and all that. He can't be killed because he's not king yet. Boy, everything's going fine. And then he acts differently when he becomes king uh, with Bathsheba. And God said, trouble will never leave your house. And, uh, but he's in heaven today, isn't he? He is. Uh, what, what's the deal? The, the, it, it, it's going on and on and on. Israel did this thing, you know, they're doing fine, and boom, they're down in Egypt, and they're there for 400 years, and God sends Moses. And out they come. The pattern is all over the place. Uh, you can find it in the Apostle Paul's life, the Apostle Peter's life, and just about anybody that's got more than a few verses about their life in the Scripture fall into that pattern. What's God doing? This is where he prepares you for that because continued success does prepare you much. You begin to think you deserve it. You begin to think you are somebody. And you know what you find out down here? You find out he's somebody. And the whole thing is that this is a, a personal experience that uh, songs are written on one side of this thing or the other. Uh, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, saved a wretch like me, and once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Wonderful. When peace like a river tendeth my way, or sorrows like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, it was taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is. It's well with your soul right now. You just don't, th don't see it. It's, uh, uh, pain changes things. Pain changes people's attitudes. It changes their personalities. It changes a lot of things. And if you let that run away with you, I don't know, maybe you're going to nosedive down even further. I, I, I don't know. I know this, that uh, down here is when the promises become precious to you. Over here, they're new to you. And man, this is exciting. Wow, you, you mean to tell me Jesus Christ is coming again? I was in the Methodist church for 29 years and never heard that. I hadn't been saved and in church but two or, week, or three weeks and I already heard a couple messages on it. What, what is, really, he's coming back. Show me that in the Bible. And sure enough, the first Thessalonians chapter four and other places, it talks about those things and you take a look at that and say, wow. That's wonderful. And um, you're going to go through this whether you deserve it or not. Now, sometimes it's chastening. Sometimes it's pruning. But it's uh, going to happen. The, this is where God trains people. He purifies your motives down here. He convinces you that he's uh, in charge. He uh, shows you that uh, he can supply in the middle of the storm, that the anchor rope holds. He uh, proves to you that uh, he means his promises. He proves to you that all things work together for good. He proves to you that thinking that strange is some fiery trial that is to come upon you. Uh, it is better to suffer for righteousness' sake than it is to suffer for sin. And all kinds of things, that lessons that you learn down there that make a, a tremendous difference in your, in your life. Now, you may go through this thing uh, financially. You may go through it emotionally. You may go through it spiritually. You may go through it with your health. Uh, go through it with, uh, go through a church split and tell me that that doesn't happen. It, it, it just, <clears throat> when God develops a pattern that works, he uses it more than once. 
And uh, in 1 Kings chapter seven, we, uh, 17, we talked about uh, a little bit in the past here about uh, Elijah going to the brook and about the pattern that's there that I call the cycle of faith. And this one, of course, I call the swamp. But this, uh, <clears throat> when somebody's down here, they uh, don't appreciate much you coming along and saying, you know, I know exactly how you feel. No, you don't. Uh, you may have been through the swamp yourself, and if you have, generally what you go down there is you hold their hand and just cry with them. Uh, we had a couple in our church had a miscarriage, about the third child. They had two, and then she miscarried, and the baby was born dead and all that kind of thing. And uh, I'm a new pastor, man. I don't want to go to the hospital. I don't, I don't know what to say. I don't, I, I, what am I? What am I? I went to the hospital. I was a pastor. I ought to go to the hospital when people are in that fix. And I went. And I uh, walked in the room, and the two of them are there. They're both crying. It wasn't five minutes later, and all three of us are crying. I, I, I don't remember a thing I said. But a year later on a Wednesday night, she stands up and gives a testimony about what a blessing Pastor Keck was to visit us in the hospital uh, when we had the miscarriage. And I'm sitting there, what in the world did I say? So after the service, I went to her. I said, what did I say? She said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't remember you saying anything. I just remember you were there. That's what they need. They need somebody there. They don't need somebody to tell them that, uh, you know, if you uh, would have not been such a sinner, uh, uh, no. There's a song about to be careful dealing with people who are in a place where you've never been. And this is exactly the, the spot. The swamp is uh, full of skeeters. If the skeeters don't get you, let the gators will. Uh, the bloodhounds are after you. Uh, you got bad water to drink and uh, rainfall to endure and you get um, it's uh, it falls apart a uh, Baptist preacher in Green Bay at another church developed throat cancer well, what are you gonna do I, I, I he makes us live in speaking and he can't speak What's up, Lord? I don't know. About three months he's down here, and then boom, all of a sudden they can't find any cancer. I, I don't know why God does this. I don't know why he does that. I don't know why he lets that happen, except I do know it happens. Except for the fact that after you're going through it about two or three times myself, you begin to think, you know, I do my best work when I'm down there. I mentioned to you about starting churches and so forth. Uh, I suffered a church split I told you about in 2000. And between there and 2005, it took us about five years to get over it. We started more churches in that five-year period than we have before or since. I pastored two churches, uh, I think two different times in that five-year period. What are you saying, preacher? I used to drive over to Manitowoc, folks, I didn't know what I was doing. The preacher had disgraced himself over there and the fellow that started the church out of Virginia had come up and talked to his own young man and said, you better resign the church and I'm gonna talk with Brother Keck to see if he won't take it on, on an interim basis to see if he can't rescue this thing. And I'm going over there. I never rescued a church before. I, 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 I. What'd you do? I went over there and I sat at a desk and cried. Sometimes I laid on the floor and cried. Why? I didn't know what I was doing. Lord, listen, would you, uh, this is such a confusing time down here, folks, you don't know what you're doing. And I'm down there one day and uh, knock on a door and in walks a young man. And I says, hey, Tim, wow, it's good to see you. Well, Tim had been in my Bible study at Sanger Powers Prison west of town about five miles for several years, uh, finishing out a sentence. And uh, I didn't know he lived in Manitowoc. 
I, I didn't know that he was interested in attending the Baptist church. I mean, I did everything I could to try to encourage that. But Tim was a little bit of a, you know, while I'm in prison, I'm going to pay attention, and afterwards I don't much care much. Well, he had uh, found out that uh, going through this himself, uh, and so all of a sudden we've added a man church member. And then Millie shows up. She's an elderly gal from down in Milwaukee. They can't find a nursing home for her down there. She's a Baptist, played piano in a Baptist church for, I don't know, 50 years or whatever it was. And uh, she's now in a nursing home in Manitowoc, and uh, all of a sudden Millie shows up. Says, I can play piano for you. She was a trip, man. She'd sit out there, uh, you know, just about 10 people in front of me, and Millie would say, speak up, preacher, I can't hardly hear you. <laughs> uh, just, uh, what are we going through? I, I don't know. <laughs> Another guy from the Sanger Power Prison shows up. Uh, we've had, uh, uh, all of a sudden, one Sunday morning, I was preaching over, normally I didn't preach on Sunday morning, one of our men did, but this Sunday morning I, I was over there, and, and uh, five young ladies showed up from Michigan State University. And I'm saying, what? He said, yeah, last Saturday afternoon, we're all Christians. We got together to pray, and God said, get in the car and go west until you find a Baptist church. And uh, so we drove all night and uh, parked across the street. And when we got up this morning, it said, True Vine Baptist Church right across the street. We said, hey, this is of God. This is where we're supposed to go. Let's go to church. I'm saying, you're, you're not even a fruitcake. <laughs> But you know, I sure enjoyed having five visitors in church that morning. Yeah. There you go. Encouraged me to, to no end, man. And then uh, Paul gets saved, and uh, you know, he's a young man just about to graduate from high school. And, and um, my goodness, man, what a lot. We eventually turned the church over to Brother Harrison. It had four members in it. And it's running in the 40s and 50s today. Uh, Harrison knows what he's doing. I didn't know what I was doing. Just go over there and cry. Did you make some visits? Yeah, I made some visits. Once in a while, the Lord said, go down to the gas station down there and buy your lunch and try to witness to the gal that serves you the hamburger. And, you, you know, it, I... I was sitting there again one day, and this Episcopalian rector, I don't even know what a rector is, but he came in, he knocked on the door, and I said, hi, he says, my name's Johnson, or whatever it was, and I said, well, I'm Pastor Keck, glad to have you here, why don't you, he says, uh, I just want you to know, I'm uh, from the Episcopal Church, just up the road, a few doors, they called that part of the town, Holy Hill, because there's seven churches on that one hill. One of them was his church. And he came down and sat there and said, listen, I just want you to know our congregation is praying for you. Now, folks, I'm an independent Baptist. I want the prayers of Episcopalian like I want a hole in the head. But he said, uh, we understand you came into some bad publicity and the previous pastor has disgraced himself and uh, you've got a very difficult task here of rescuing this congregation. And I was designated to come by this week and let you know that we're praying for you. He stayed about three minutes. He got up and walked out. I mean, it sure helps you endure that. Uh, you are going to have to go through it because that's the pattern God established. And that's exactly what he, he wants to uh, purify your motives and uh, correct your attitudes and your opinions and, and uh, give you some compassion for the brethren and teach you that you can't trust the arm of flesh even when it's your own. And he's going to put you down there, whether you deserve it or not. Doesn't really make any difference. You're going to go through it, and that's how the Lord works. He, he, hmm. I told a preacher 
today, or yesterday, I think it was, that uh, he's one of my heroes. And uh, he said, why? I said, because you've uh, gone through the swamp and you came out the other side still loving the Lord, his book, and God's people. That's the thing. Can you come out loving the book, loving the Lord, and loving God's people? That's what he wants to do. Now, you may go through this several times in your life, once financially, once with your health and uh, all that kind of thing. Uh, who knows? Maybe somebody here is right in the middle of the swamp this evening. Uh, I want you to know that uh, Jesus Christ has not left you. He promised to not leave you or forsake you. See, but it looks like that's exactly one of the things he's settling with you is to quit making your decisions on what things look like and quit making decisions on circumstances, make decisions on the promises of the Bible. Um, over and over and over again, this, this pattern pops up with the nation of Israel and individual saints in, in either the Old or the New Testament. Peter, oh, he's a good guy, man. I mean, he comes along, man, he's a, he's a house of fire. Right? And then denies the Lord. And sometime later, Peter, lovest thou me? Well, thou knowest I love you, Lord. Yeah, I do. But you're going to confess it twice more because you denied me three times. So, Peter, lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. Lovest thou me? You know the story. Amen. What did you have that? He preached on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 folks get saved. There's a, I've never met a Baptist preacher yet that's baptized 3,000 folks in one day. Boy, would I like to do that. You say, preacher, you'd probably die of a heart attack. What a way to go, man. What a way to go on the, the 3,000th one that you, you can't hardly lift back up and God calls you. Oh, what a thing, man. What a thing. Uh, I suppose Peter had help that day. I, 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 I don't know. I, I just know that he's the guy that denied Christ. Tradition says he was crucified upside down in India someplace persecuted for being a Christian. I don't know. I don't trust tradition much. But I do know that uh, here he wasn't capable of preaching on the day of Pentecost. And here he was. That experience made all the difference for him. Uh, John, they tried to put in a pot of oil and couldn't boil him. Can you imagine that, having somebody throw you in a boiling pot of oil and it has no effect on you? That's the three Hebrew children in the furnace. And the king looks down and says, I see four men down in there. And the fourth one's like the son of God. Yeah. He goes with you through the swamp. He doesn't take you out of the swamp until you're ready, but he will put you in there, but he'll go with you. And the whole thing is, is that can you still serve God if you get hit for doing right? Can you do right and get away with it? No. No, you can't do wrong and get away with it either. There's law of sowing and reaping. But you can't do right and get away with it. Uh, there's a world of flesh and the devil are going to see to it that if you do right, you're going to pay a price. We had a young lady in our church that uh, wanted to work for a fast food joint, or at least interviewed for the job, and um, they said, uh, listen, we have a uniform to wear, and uh, you, you need to wear some pants. And she said, well, I, would, I prefer not to do that. Uh, I have religious reasons why I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be separate from the world, and I would uh, rather wear a skirt. I uh, wear it long enough to wear nothing shows, but I just want you to know that and they said, I'm sorry, we can't hire you. All right, now she goes home crying. And she talks to her dad, and her dad, being a good man, says, honey, uh, did you get that standard from God, or did you get it from the church? She said, well, dad, I thought I got it from God. And then God will bless. If you got it from the church, you better get rid of it. But if you got it from God, you better hang on to it.
It wasn't long. She found a job. Paid more than a fast food joint did. I had a man in a church one time. You remember his name was Dale. Catholic fellow. Got saved on a college campus in Wisconsin. And came to church and found us somehow. I don't even remember how it was. And all of a sudden he's there on a Sunday morning. Uh, married man with a wife. And uh, uh, next time he comes, he's got his mother with him, and, 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 and things are going, going real well, and I'm talking to him about baptism. <clears throat> and um, he says, you know, my whole family is Catholic. I mean, my brothers, my aunts and uncles, grandparents, everybody. I says, I don't doubt it. I had one lady in our church tell me she has 125 first cousins within 25 miles of her porch. And she got baptized. Well, that'll disturb a Catholic family, let me tell you. So I said, well, how's it going? He says, well, I just graduated from college. He says, I'm looking for a job. He said, the truth of the matter is, I'm having a little trouble finding a job. Bingo. Hey, uh, you got some instructions to obey, son. You, I bet you can get out of there. He got baptized on a Sunday. Monday morning, the De Pere School District called him and hired him on the spot, sight unseen. Nice job. He eventually became a soccer coach for St. Norbert College and a lot of other things that he amounted to, financial manager in a, in a firm. What, what's going on? What's going on was the swamp for him was to get him to uh, obey. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes you're already obedient. Sometimes you are doing everything right that you know how to do. Sometimes it still falls apart. Um, a good man can have a weak moment, can he not? So here's David saying, I think I'm going to go and live with the Philistines in order to get rid of King Saul chasing me around. Poor decision. But he got there. And the Philistine king was glad to see him. And he gave him a village to live in. And, uh, you know, hey, this is looking pretty good. And David makes uh, inroads against the Kenites and uh, brings back some spoil. And the uh, Philistines look at that and say, hey, you know, this, uh, this guy may uh, really not want to be in Israel. And then uh, the king puts him in his army, and the elders of uh, Philistia decide that's a little fast. Uh, let's ask David to stay home. Before he gets home, somebody comes along and burns his city and takes his wife and wives and kids captive. How's it look now, David? Uh, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. You know how to do that? You're going to learn. You're going to have to learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord. Uh, so he got off in prayer someplace and made a, a law in the army that if uh, you get tired pursuing the enemy and can't cross the river, uh, the 400 guys that do, uh, when they win the war and bring the spoil back, the 200 that couldn't cross the river because they're too tired, get some of the spoil too. Okay. Uh, but it cost him, uh, his wife and family for a while, he, he got them back, but he learned that maybe I shouldn't be in the land of the Philistines. Uh, what is, is uh, how does God teach you a lesson? 
Well, it'd be kind of nice if we'd sit down and reason with you and say, come, let us reason together, saith the Lord, let the sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow, and uh, let you and I have a talk, and uh, it'd be nice when it happens like that, and sometimes it does. But there's other times that God knows pain is a great teacher, and he'll let you have some. It's not because he hates you. He's not trying to kill you. He's not trying to get rid of you. He loves you enough to refine you. He's got something special for you. And here, you are not ready for it. Out here, now you're ready for it, and boom, it happens. I was just talking to somebody before this service about somebody who had cancer. And uh, between uh, going to one hospital to the other hospital where the cancer specialists are, when she got there, there wasn't any cancer there. But when the doctor sits down and tells you, you got the big C, you immediately go here. And she was there for three or four days, and then went to the other hospital and found out God had fixed it. Isn't that a wonderful story? Don't you like to see that happen? There's Moses. He's raised in the Egyptian house. You know, his daughter or sister put him in contact with Pharaoh's daughter. He's raised in Egyptian, and he kills a man. How long is this down here before he sees the burning bush? Forty years. Wow, he was 40 when this happened, he's 80 when this happened, and he dies at 120. Moses has three periods in his life. And my land man, Lord, I don't want it to take 40 years. No, I don't either. But the idea is that regardless how long it takes, you are uh, under a, uh, a promise given God who is checking you out as to whether or not you believe him. A uh, young couple was engaged and uh, everything was going fine. You know, the love light was in her eyes and the love light was in his eyes and, you know, all that kind of stuff that goes on. And uh, he... Uh, said something that um, embarrassed her, it happened to be in public, and uh, what do we do? Uh, she went home at night and uh, cried herself to sleep and talked to her mother the next morning about what in the world's going on. Can I tell you folks, um, in any marriage, he will say something that'll embarrass you in public before it's over. Just gonna happen. It's just. And she will do something. I had a man call me up just recently and want to talk to me and to say, listen, uh, your wife has uh, <clears throat> said something. And I said, really? He said, yeah, in an email note that uh, she emailed to me, and uh, it was of such a nature that I don't want to show it to my wife. I'm afraid my wife will be hurt by it. So I went to Alice about it, and Alice said, you know, how about if we establish a principle where before I write anything like that, I check with you. I said, that sounds like a good idea to me. And how about before I write anything that's controversial, I check with you. What's up? Uh, I'm married to a good woman. Amen. But she can make mistakes just like anybody else. And God puts us down here once in a while with the idea of he's not hating you, he's not done with you, he's not flushing you down the drain. He's preparing you for success but you're gonna to have to go through the swamp. Yep. You're just not exempt 
from the pattern that God uses with everybody. What a wonderful thing it is to know about that before it happens. What a wonderful thing it is when you see it coming and uh, you bounce off the bottom here. It's a wonderful thing to say, you know, I remember pastor telling me about this. You know, I've, uh, I, I checked it out in scriptures a couple of times myself and I found it in the life of the apostle Paul and, and uh, you know, I found it in the life of John Mark and I found it in the life of Peter and you know, um, I guess now it's my turn. Yes, it is. Uh, nobody else knows what you're going through. They may have been through the swamp themselves, but the swamp is individual. It's not the same for you as it is for me. There's lessons to be learned that you just can't do right and get away with it. There is motivations and attitudes and actions that God wants you to have that are different than you have now. And we, we kicks are a, a proud bunch. We're, um, we're Prussians. What's that? High class Germans. At least that's how we look at it. And uh, you give us a third chance and we'll whip the world this time. We couldn't get it done in World War I or World War II, but you give us a third chance. And uh, what, what, uh, what's up? Well, what's up is uh, <clears throat> Harley kicked his head to get on his face before God a few times and say, Lord, uh, my Prussian heritage is doing me absolutely no good. I've had a great man for a father and a great mother for 10 years, but Lord, I, something slipped up in the DNA. I'm not half the man my dad was. Uh, Lord, uh, Lord, Lord, could you help me? Like I said, I had a church split in 2000. It took about five years to get over that thing. It started out about five nights a week Went down to three, eventually to one, and I'm over it now. But I'd go downstairs by that wood burner, throw a couple logs in it, sometime around 12 to 2 in the morning, and spend an hour, sometimes to 4 in the morning, just crying. Lord, there's got to be something the matter with me to have that many people walk off at once. They've got to have some good point, and, and what, what they're, they can't be that big a jerk. At least all of them can be. Now, Lord, would you, uh, would you show me? I had a good Christian friend walk to me and says, Harley, anybody who takes a hit like that has got a little things he's got to get right with God about. Well, thank you, brother. I, <clears throat> I needed that like I needed a hole in the head, but there I am crying. And uh, about 3, 3.30 in the morning, I said, Lord, listen, I sure would like to get some sleep tonight. Could you uh, let me go back to bed? And without fail, I'd walk upstairs, go back to bed, and go to sleep. Uh, what is it? I found out that I'm spending too much time crying and not enough praising God. I found out that I'm not uh, near the pastor I thought I was. Us Prussians, you know. We. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, I see the swamp coming a few times. I'm getting older now, and the swamp is a little bit bigger this time. Than, uh, but you must understand that um, it would be good for you to uh, take a look at that thing and say, you know, if Pastor Keck's right, I got one of those coming up. Or you might say, Pastor Keck is right because I'm right in the middle of those things. I'm not trying to be right, folks. I'm trying to be educational. I'm trying to help you 
Understand that if you can see it coming, if you're aware that that's what God's doing, this is a whole lot easier to take because you're not in confusion. You're not surprised that it's happened to you. You have some spiritual resources that you can make use of. Call upon me and I will answer thee and show the great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend him. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. That's what he's after. That's what he's after. I do not understand why God uses some of the people he uses. I classify people as good folks or, or uh, nerds, jerks. And uh, I, I don't understand why God uses some jerks. But you get up close to him, you talk to him a little bit, and you find out, you know, he's been through something I don't know anything about. He's been through a swamp that I've not gone through. Well, I tell you, that swamp will give you some compassion about the next guy. And like I said, you may not go and say anything. You may just sit there and cry with them. But the idea is that this is going to affect your life. Somebody you love is going to go through that. One of your kids is going to go through that. We buried Jeff here about five years ago. And uh, I couldn't believe it. It was either 22 or 23 full-time servants of God showed up. My good friend, Brother Welder, flew up from Texas to attend Jeff's funeral. I had the fellow, three Weiss brothers who are in our state pastor, and they all showed up. One of them clear over in Stoughton, Wisconsin, which is clear across the state. Several of those guys drove six hours or more to come to a brain-damaged man's funeral that they really didn't know very well but they knew I was going through the swamp. And they showed up. I have a tendency to be critical of other preachers. I, it, 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 pray for me. When I come to mind, pray about that. And one of those guys can't preach his way out of a paper bag until he showed up for Jeff's funeral. And the next year, they let him preach at camp, and all of a sudden, the guy had something to say. All of a sudden, he's worth listening to. All of a sudden, I got the picture on the thing. What's going on? I was a little too critical to the brethren. You see how God works? He doesn't come down and put his arm around you and say, no, you're a little too critical to the brethren. Uh, he's going to put you through the swamp. Now, generally speaking, one trip through the swamp, and you got that thing solved. Now, you have to solve something else in your life, and it'll take a second trip through a second swamp. But the idea is that that's where things get fixed. Would you believe that? That's my phone. I don't even know how to turn the thing off. That happened at, at the meeting this afternoon, and I, 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 turned, I thought I turned it off. <clears throat> it's time to quit. <laughs> <laughs> I got the picture, Lord. I got it. I want you to carefully consider about what is your response to the swamp. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them who are the called to his, to his purpose. Is that Mike? Is it? I'm quitting. I'm getting out of here before this thing is quit. <laughs> I just want you to know that uh, when I see something that is a pattern in the Bible, I am drawn to it. Because uh, when God's got something that works, he uses it over and over and over again. And we have an opportunity 
to put something in the bank against the swamp experience. And your something in the bank is a, a surrender to the experience. All right, Lord, I don't want it to happen, but if it does, I'm not going to swear. I'm not going to get drunk. I'm not going to do something stupid. I'm going to spend some time talking to you. All God's people said, Lord, help us. I love these folks. I'm so thankful for them. They're a strong church, Lord. They're doing a good job. Uh, Lord, uh, Adam didn't get away with it. And uh, Jesus Christ himself didn't get away with it. Lord, we're not going to get away with it. We are going to have to have some times where we're in a swamp fighting the skeeters and the gators and, and uh, putting up with the difficulties. And uh, Lord, it's so distracting that sometimes we forget to pray. Sometimes we forget how important spiritual things are. Sometimes we forget how definite God intends to be with our growth. Lord, uh, maybe somebody here tonight already in the swamp. Lord, uh, comfort them. Uh, give them a friend that can cry with them. Give, give them a blessing. Give them, Lord, minister to them like you've ministered to me where uh, you dry the tears from their eyes. Build some hope in their heart. Give them a cause for which it's worth dying for. And give them the opportunity to perform it. Bless those, Lord, that are in the swamp tonight. And for the rest of us, Lord, we pray that we would be uh, with advance notice. Have a little bit more in the bank when it happens than we'd have otherwise. Let us, Lord, be tenderhearted about the thing. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Dunbar. Let's all stand. Let's stand with heads bowed and eyes closed. The invitation's open. The altar's open. Good message tonight. What you do and how you respond in the swamp makes all the difference in the world. I've watched people go shipwreck in the swamp. I've watched people come out of that thing strong with new hope, with new promise. It all depends on how you respond. And you're going to go through it if you haven't gone through it already. And it's not just, you know, you, Sometimes I think we go through those, those swamps and then we say, well, I'm glad that's over. Well, it might be for now. That doesn't mean it isn't going to happen again. And I don't know about the rest of you, but the swamps always seem to take me by surprise. And you've got to have a determination even before you go into it. You're not going to quit. You love God. Uh, you're going to be faithful. You're going to stick with the stuff. God's working on your heart tonight. Now's the time. You come. Father, we want to thank you for what we've heard tonight. 
It's one thing to quote that verse, all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. And we do know that the following verse tells us that you're conforming us into your image and that we're destined for that. But Lord, that's another thing to actually go through it. We have to just put all our trust and all our faith and in you to allow you to do the work that you will always do for us in the middle of that swamp. We're up to our neck in alligators. We uh, are bit, we're hurt, we're wounded. Lord, I've been there, been there several times. It's never fun going through it, but it sure is sweet to get the results on the other side. Sure is sweet to be able to look back over your shoulder and say, God got me through it. God was good the whole time. Lord, please uh, use this message tonight, not just now, but in the future. And help us to to meditate on the things that we've heard tonight. Thank you, Lord, for each one that's here. Thank you, God, for the opportunity we've had to be preached to and to hear the the singing and the prayers and just the fellowship one with another. Pray that you bless that fellowship afterwards. Give us a good day tomorrow. Bring us back again for a final meeting. And bring us back expectant to get a blessing from you. In Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said. Amen. Amen. You're dismissed.